We have as a guest today Dr. Steve Nabella, who just dropped in on us, somewhat unannounced, but also somewhat planned. Steve, tell them who you are. Uh, as, as Randy said, I'm Steve Novell. I'm the host of The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, which is a weekly science podcast affiliated with the James Randy Educational Foundation. So, Randy, we were talking about um, earlier the uh, intersection between the human brain, which is my specialty, I'm a neurologist, and magic, because magicians are actually put into practice a lot of uh, practical knowledge of the human brain, about how to deceive the way people process information, so ways of exploiting the foibles of the human brain. The, the point uh, that I would make here is that uh, as a magician, I discovered that uh, as a young magician, just as a kid, I discovered that uh, I had to know a lot about psychology and the way people's brains work. Now, I never got into it as deeply as you have, of course, you've spent your life at it, but I did learn a few things. And some of those things I think uh, I was able to impart to not only the other magicians, but a few scientists along the way. For example, one thing that we learn as soon as we get into the profession is that people assume a lot. Now, we assume a lot, this is my analysis of it, because otherwise we'd become catatonic. we just stop dead. You know, you, you look at traffic lights. Red means stop and green means go and yellow means go like hell. Mm -hmm. And um, if you had to wonder as you reach the edge of the pavement, have they changed the meaning of the lights? Uh, are the colors changed around, or am I not seeing them correctly? You know, I often tell my audiences uh, when they sit down after they've been comfortable and I've talked to them for a while, they say, you know, you folks uh, make a lot of assumptions, uh, and I hope you will for the sake of my act. I didn't see anyone test the chair. Mm -hmm. When they came in here, did you test the chair to make sure it was sufficient to support your weight? No. You took it for granted. You have to make assumptions. And uh, I also point out to them, for example, in, um, uh, when I'm, I'm teaching young fellows uh, to do magic uh, routines and think as a magician, I say, never walk on stage and say, I have here a regular deck of cards. No, because that allows them the possibility of thinking, maybe that's not a regular deck mm -hmm. of cards. But if you take a deck of cards, unwrap it, break the seal on it, shake it out into your hand, toss the box away, start shuffling it, the assumption is it's an ordinary deck of cards. Right. Now, they're not convinced of it necessarily, but at least they make that tentative assumption. Mm -hmm. Right, but if you make a specific claim, then you're inviting them to question that claim. Exactly, and you don't invite them to question any of these things. Our brains make a lot of subconscious assumptions for us. Indeed. And once you learn what those are, then you really can freak people out. That's what the basis of a lot of optical illusions is exploiting those assumptions that our, mm -hmm. our brain is making just by the way it evolved to process information. For example, if something's smaller, it probably is farther away. Things get smaller yes. as it gets farther away. So you could trick people with optical illusions to, to think that something is farther away by, by presenting them with a smaller version of something than they're used to seeing, for example. How do magicians take advantage of that kind of thing? In an illusion box. Now, we all know that there are boxes that are designed specially to create optical effects and illusions. Suppose you have a, a large square box there into which a girl would fit, sort of curled up, if she wanted to curl up and if she were there. And when you open the front of the box, you see nothing. Now, the girl, this is hypothetical, of course, may be behind mm -hmm. the box, hanging out the back a bit, for example. And believe me, that could happen. If you design the inside of the box. Now, I've seen magicians make big mistakes where the inside of the box is black, for example. Mm -hmm. When you look at black like that, you see nothing. Right. You're not seeing empty, you're seeing nothing. If it's bright red or yellow or something, or blue or whatever, uh, you can sort of see the back of it, but it's still a, a massive color. Suppose you wanted to put stripes in there. Which way should the stripes go? This way or that way? If you wanted to give the illusion of depth, you mean? or that Well, that I, I want them to be able to see to the back and know they're seeing the back without revealing anything. I can imagine it working either way, but maybe vertical stripes would work better? No, if there's a false box, uh, back in the box. That is, if it's actually forward more, mm -hmm. because if the stripes are this way, they can do convergence on them. I'm talking about physiologically now and optically. Mm -hmm. But if the stripes are this way, they can't do that. So there is a preference. I'm, again, this is not making a big point, but it's the kind of thing that we have to think about mm -hmm. when we design these things. 
So with the with the horizontal stripes, you could make it look as if they're looking to the back of the box, but in yeah. fact, the girls could be for hypothetically standing behind. But they can see the box is empty because they can see the back of it. You see. Yeah, that's that, that's uh, very very interesting. Is, can you give me another example of a way in which a magician on stage would exploit those kind of neurological assumptions people make in order to carry out an illusion? Addressing the audience, for example, the magician may put his hand in his pocket casually and and chat with them and make a few jokes, perhaps. He may do that for a very good reason, not because he's trying to get rid of something or get something from his pocket. He wants them to get used to the fact that he often addressed them by putting his hand casually into his pocket and then nodding at them and walking about the stage casually. Now, next time he puts his hand in his pocket, it may be to get or to get rid of something. So they've begun to accept that that's the way this man behaves. Mm -hmm. He does this sort of thing. So that, that's a, a good, uh, well, neurological uh, right. situation for you, if you wish. Yeah, so you habituate them that's to right. the com elements of the trick which are, which are critical to the trick itself, but you don't want it to stand out. I'll give you a really good working example of that. Um, many years ago when I was just a tad, about so well, I've always been this tall, uh, little guy, and I went to the casino theater, I'll never forget it. I saw a Chinese magician who for years I've been trying to think of the name of, and uh, he was Chinese from China, and I have not been able to refresh the memories of any of the magicians of today. They must have seen him, right, because he did tour the United States and Canada. But uh, he had a wonderful effect. Uh, he had a limp, first of all. He was a little gimpy. And, uh, but he handled it very well, and you, you saw that he had this, this problem with his gait. And he would go around the stage, big smile, wonderful production of goldfish and every sort of wonderful animal and, and object. And uh, he closed his show with a big uh, extravaganza with all the girls on stage, some very statuesque young ladies, I must say. With this gimp on it, you got sort of used to seeing him um, uh, almost stumble about, not quite, but just a, a slight hesitation in his uh, gait. And uh, then they, they dressed in big headdresses and costumes, very flowery, and his chief assistant came forward, a statuesque blonde, and you know, she put on this lion head of some kind and with a big cape, and bright gold colored costume and he was in a dark green costume with spangles all over it and he put on some other sort of dragon head and uh, the two of them danced about on the stage and mixed in with the the rest of the crew and then they went down to the back of the stage way down stage and then came forward they marched forward holding hands and suddenly he lost his gimp and she picked it up and when they reached the front of the stage, they took off the heads. That was the magician. That was the girl. And they had changed costumes on the way somehow, changed position. But the gimp, when we saw him leave the theater after it, he wasn't limping. That was entirely an act that he sold the audience on accepting that he was the one who stumbled about the stage. And of course, the, the, the reason why we are interested in this kind of thing, both as skeptics and as mm -hmm. magicians, the lesson here is that anyone can be fooled because we all oh, have the absolutely. same meat in our heads, the same, uh, the same hardwiring, the same processing. And is that a technical term, meat, meat in head? your head? Absolutely. Yes, okay. Yes, we're all meatheads. And therefore, anyone can be fooled. We are not mm -hmm. perfect processors of information. No. There's a lots of ways in which the, are the way we perceive things and think about things is flawed and that can lead us to erroneous conclusions. Now, magicians use that for entertainment mm -hmm. by leading us to erroneous conclusions and then revealing something which then is, be, entertains us. But of course, psychics and frauds and charlatans can use the same tricks exactly. in order to exploit, exploit the innocent or exploit Very people. True. And no one is beyond being fooled because we all have the same human neurology. Exactly, and we uh, have the same weaknesses and the same strengths. You know, I'm, I'm astonished you have been astonished about this all of your life, but I'm astonished every time I discover something new that this hunk of gray jelly behind my ears will do or won't do, because there are a lot of things that it won't do. But uh, I, I'm, I'm rather satisfied. At the age of 80, uh, I guess I've learned a few things somewhere along the line. Steve, I want to thank you for coming in today. It's a great pleasure to see you and, uh, and your companions that came along with you. It was fun, and uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Thank you, Randy. Always a pleasure. We thank you for watching this latest episode of James Randi Speaks. 
For more of James Randi and the Educational Foundation, make sure you visit randy.org.